Praise the Lord, brothers and sisters, and thank you very much for joining us in this video. We pray that you are well, and we hope that you have been having a great weekend and that you had a great week. Uh, we're just happy to be alive and glad to be uh, aware that we're alive, all right? That is one beautiful blessing. I know this seems a bit different, but uh, uh, this is the only way that I could record at the moment, uh, being that uh, things are a bit pressing. Uh, but we wanted to at least uh, do a video to encourage you and and just uh, share the word of God with you. We hope that this will suffice and that we can get the point across. Um, we just wanted to update you. We for those who are members in King Street, South Carolina, want to update you. We uh, sent out a, a message uh, about gathering. Uh, we're still praying about that. Uh, there are a lot of things going on right now at the moment, and we want to make sure we're as safe as possible. So we'll be following up with with more information. But we do want to remind you that on uh, this week, we will uh, convene uh, and have our study on a teleconference call. Um, this gives us an opportunity to talk to one another. We have not uh, heard from one another in such a while, and... Uh, it, 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 well, I will say all of us have not had an opportunity to get together and talk to each other. So we're going to do that, and uh, we pray that it will be a blessing to you, and you will find that it will encourage you and give you strength, okay? So let's, let's do a few things. Let's get into the Word of God. First, before we do that, let's just, let's just take a moment to pray. Um, I'm really sensing the need to pray more and uh, just ask the Lord's blessing. So let's just take a moment to pray before our Father. Lord God, we thank you and we, we praise you. We just glorify your name. We thank you for your goodness. Thank you for being so kind to us and so awesome. And we are just grateful to be your children and have this opportunity to come to you in this manner. We ask you, Lord God, to bless us. Just give us strength. Give us the guidance. Give us the ability and the will to do the things that are pleasing in your sight. We'll always be thankful. We'll always be grateful. It's in the name of Jesus Christ we pray. Amen. All right. So let's look at a, a passage. One of my favorite passages is Matthew chapter 633. And I want to share this with you this, uh, this, this morning. Uh, I want us to look at this passage, even though it is very familiar. I want to look at verse 33 and verse number 34. I'll read from the New Living Translation. You can read from any translation that you feel will help you or uh, give you the opportunity to understand it the best. All right. But it says, seek the kingdom of God above all else and live righteously and he will give you everything you need. So don't worry about tomorrow for tomorrow will bring its own worries. Today's trouble is enough for today. For a few moments, uh, we want to uh, speak on the topic, uh, thinking and living heavenly, all right? Thinking and living heavenly. This passage is probably one of the most popular passages of Jesus Christ. I, don't, I won't dare say it is the most popular, but it is definitely one of the most popular. And the reason it is so popular is because of the way that it challenges us, it puts us in a position to really challenge ourselves and think hard about the things that we invest our time into, the things that we focus and place our energy into. And uh, many times it causes us to dig deep inside of us to investigate whether or not we are really thinking in a way that would be uh, acceptable to Jesus Christ. Are we uh, living our lives the way that Jesus wants us to live it? That is the thing this text challenges us to do and think about. I, I remember uh, one time, uh, and this is my life verse. Uh, this verse is my life verse. And the reason it is my life verse is because there was a time when I had this long plans, list of plans, had all these different agendas, all these different things that I wanted to do with my life and the things that I thought I would do to create a successful life. 
And I remember in the midst of all of that, the one thing that made all of my list of desires possible was the job that I had. In other words, I had to excel and I had to go and I had to do well and, and move up within the uh, industry that I was in. And something tragic happened uh, right in the middle of when uh, of things going well, when it seemed as if things were just going in the right direction, I lost that job. And I remember feeling like I was the uh, greatest failure of the world. I felt like my whole world just collapsed. And so I, I remember being jobless. I was, uh, you know, just really down about the loss of that job because I, I literally put my whole future into uh, that job going well. And I remember at that moment, I was walking around my parents' yard, just thinking about it and praying and, and trying to think through what would be the next step. And I remember this verse, Matthew 6, coming to my mind, seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness. And that was the moment where I was able to realize that this is a moment to really focus on what God wants you to do, what his plans are. Maybe you need to change your agenda and change your intentions. And uh, at that moment, I began to realize what it meant to be, what it means to be a, a Christian, a follower of Jesus Christ. To be a Christian means to allow God and to accept the fact, I won't say allow God, but to accept the fact that many times in life, God will literally disrupt your plans and he will detach you from things that hold a place in your life that should only be reserved for him. In other words, he will challenge the idols in your life and put you in a position to where you will recognize that the true meaning of life comes from one's devotion to its creator. All right. And at that moment, I realized that the most important thing in my life, the most important thing to be doing at that moment and in every moment of our lives is to be seeking and following Jesus Christ to be understanding and willingly participating in his will for my life, all right? And here's the thing, the will of God will always be accomplished. But this is the thing that I love about God. He does not force us to accept his will. He does not force us to necessarily uh, accept the will that he has for our life. Uh, he gives us a choice uh, to participate or not, okay? And so what we find in this text is that one's ability to participate in the will of God for their life is based on where their heart is. OK, this is why Jesus says where your heart is, that's where your treasure will be. Also, this text forces the reader to begin to analyze where are your efforts devoted where are your life commit where is your life commitment at is it in heavenly things or is it in earthly things now one of the troubling things about this text is that it puts us in a position to think about how we should live and many people would consider this this, this these verses to be absurd many people has gone have gone as far as to say that Jesus compelled individuals to not plan, to not look towards the future, to just go through life blindly uh, uh, without any plans or preparations, just take one day at a time and do nothing to prepare for the following days. And that's not the point of this text. Of course, Jesus has encouraged individuals in several other places to prepare and take thought for what they should do with their lives, which would, uh, would necessitate that one thinks and plans for the future. However, what he does help us to see is that we should not put our reliance on earthly things, meaning our entire existence should not be consumed with trying to figure out how do we uh, uh, maintain and grow earthly possessions. Our value should be in heaven. Now, the thing about this is when our mind is on heavenly things, we accumulate a certain element of success. And the way we do that is what is peculiar about what Jesus is saying here. 
Jesus is very, very uh, aware of the fact that we need food and clothing. We need things from day to day. In fact, he taught them earlier in this teaching to seek their daily bread. So this is the way it should go. We should live our lives day by day, knowing that God has already rationed out for us everything, everything we need in that day. All right. So we should not put so much worry on the future if we have learned that God has already prepared our daily bread. And all we have to do is ask him for the daily bread. So if God is already taking care of our needs and our minds should not be so much consumed with what we need, then what should our lives be dedicated to? That's the thing that Jesus answers. And how can we make sure that we will get the things we need in life while we are worrying about the things of God. This is the big difference between Jesus' teaching and many people in his world. Many people in the Jewish tradition, uh, rabbis would teach that a person should work in order to maintain their status and their ability to live on this earth. They should take up a trade, as the Mishnah says. It says that a person should take up a virtuous trade, a good trade. And not necessarily by the trade does one succeed, but by a trade that has merit does one succeed. So then the, uh, the, the duty of the believer is to work and take up a trade which would be in compliance uh, of the Torah that would give them the greatest opportunity to obey and do what the Torah has stated. So in other words, a person should live and work in obedience to the Torah. And by that, God opens up all of his providence. He then, he saturates us uh, with the things that we need as he would with any other creature. I, I want to read this from the Mishnah so you can understand what I'm talking about. It says this, it says, uh, for there is no trade which does not involve poverty or wealth. For poverty does not come from one's trade, nor does wealth come from one's trade. But all is in accord with a man's merit. The rabbi teaches, have you ever seen a wild beast or a bird who has a trade, yet they get along without difficulty. And were they not created only to serve me? And I was created to serve my master. So it is not logical that I should not get along without difficulty. But I have done evil and ruined my living. He goes on and the mission I goes on to tell a person that they should they should uh, uh, attain to and teach their sons uh, 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 trades with merit. Uh, they shouldn't be uh, 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 a camel driver or a barber or a sailor or a herdsman or a shopkeeper. And the list goes on explaining what they should, uh, what they should uh, work towards as a trade. And the reason for all of this is because the idea is that if we can work righteously, then God will provide his providence. Well, Jesus doesn't use that idea for a person to be taken care of. This is the big difference. And this is the thing that, that separates us from, from the idea of religious ritualistic living and Jesus living and Christian living. Jesus teaches his disciples that a person that seeks the authority and the power of God and his righteousness, that's the key word, his justice, right? Everything that they need will be added unto them, which helps us to see a crucial point. God is calling humanity to accept the fact that the world is messed up and that the world needs a king. The world needs to be governed by someone other than unfaithful human beings. The world is in need of a king and a leader and a kingdom. And it is the job of humanity to seek the one who was destined to rule from the beginning and to seek his justice 
and not the justice of any other ruler or kingdom or dynamic. By doing these things, one warrants the justice and the providence, should we say, of God. All right? God promises to take care of them. God promises to give them the food that, need, that they need, the clothing that they need. And he will provide all the things that, that are necessary. Now, this is a very different way of understanding this text because what we normally would think is that if we would just think about heaven and think about going to heaven, then we'll get everything we need while we're on earth. Well, that's actually the reverse. What God is inviting us to do as human beings, he's inviting us to uh, invite the existence of heaven into the earth, understanding that Jesus is a real king. He is a real ruler. He has a real authority and he has his way of executing justice. This is why everything he taught prior to this makes sense. Now, let's get to a crucial point in Jesus' teaching. The thing that most often rob, rob us from the ability of being able to follow this just and righteous and, uh, should we say, uh, inevitable king and, and kingdom is our love for money okay we as human beings we love wealth we love money we love material things right and the fastest way to separate yourself from the providence of God is trying by your own strength to gain all sorts of possessions which will in turn cause you to live an idolatrous life and consequently forfeit your right to be taken care of by God. Okay, this is why he says in Matthew chapter 6, verse 24, no one can serve two masters, for you will hate one and love the other. You'll be devoted to one and despise the other. You cannot serve both God and money. This is why he says that. He says you can't serve both of these things. And one of the biggest problems in our life, in our world, in our society, in this civilization, this Western civilization is our complete reliance and love for money. We have made a God out of wealth, out of money, out of material things. And what we have not recognized is that because we are so in love with money, money has shown us how much of a God it isn't. And no matter because no matter how much money we get, we seem to always want more. No matter how much money we get, we seem to always need more of it. No matter how many things we get, we always seem to need more things, right? No matter how good the thing is, we seem to always want a better thing. God is the only one that can give us himself and make us fully satisfied in him, all right? And because of that, it is proof that he is a better God than any idol could ever be all right so here's the thing brothers and sisters you got to understand that jesus is saying two things in this text he's saying first you cannot serve me and money and the second thing he is saying is that you cannot serve uh, you cannot serve me in a way that will allow you to put your works out in an attempt to demand my providence, okay? The providence of God comes from one's seeking of the kingdom and the justice of God, right? That's what it is, okay? Now, when it comes to this idea of money and all this material uh, 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 desire, what do you think about that? I heard uh, Bishop Noel Jones say this one time before. He said, Joseph was the most, the second most powerful man in the entire Egyptian kingdom. Yet he owned nothing. All right. I want you to think about that. Everything he rode was owned by someone else. The place that he lived in was owned by someone else. The clothes that he wore was given to him by someone else. All of these things were things that were given to him, and yet he was the second most powerful man. 
It lets us know something. It isn't always about what you have. It's all about what God is trying to mold you into for his own glory and for his own purpose so that through you, the world can be exposed to the power and the rule of God. That's the most important thing. And when we make up our minds to dedicate our lives to that, then everything we need will follow. I'm a living witness. I believe this. Whenever you make up your mind to chase God, your blessings will chase you. All right. You will not get a blessing by chasing the blessing. You receive all your blessings, brothers and sisters. Listen to this carefully. You receive all of your blessings by chasing God and demanding that your blessings chase you. I believe that there's a such way of living that we are in such haste. We are so driven to chase God that our blessings have to run to catch up with us so that we might receive them because our mind is always on more God, more of God, more relationship with him rather than with material things. All right. So I hope that helps. I hope that works for you. I hope you will uh, uh, take heed to this and understand that we are in the business of seeking God. And in the process of seeking God, God takes care of his people. Brothers and sisters, thank you very much for watching. I hope you have enjoyed this. I hope it has encouraged you. Lord willing, we'll get to talk again on Wednesday. I'll send out details about the time and the contact information. I hope you're able to join us. And I hope you're able to converse with us uh, over the word of God. Until then, y'all have a blessed week. Be careful, be safe, and enjoy the blessings of God. Until next time, thank you for watching, and God bless.